Hello and welcome back to What's New with Mead. This is episode four and today we're going to be talking about uh, freezing fruit and whether or not you should do that. We're also going to talk about putting your fruit in the primary and secondary and uh, kind of get some different opinions. I mean, I'm going to give you my opinions on on the various fruits that do well in that regard as well as some other things. Um, but I'm excited to be back with you guys, and uh, I hope that you guys are ready for a good episode. If you're on uh, Apple Podcasts or um, any other really podcast network, um, make sure that you rate, and that, that helps promote the show and lets me know what you think. And then, of course, if you're on YouTube watching this right now, um, then, of course, leave a like and subscribe for more. I have lots of content for you guys. So, uh, to start off today, for my first part of this, I always talk about what I'm drinking for tonight. So, um, it's Friday night, got done with my normal teaching schedule, did everything I was, you know, needed to, to be a, a good teacher, and uh, here I am, ready to enjoy this this episode. So, I'm drinking and sipping on something pretty nice. This is one of my, my meads I've really liked recently. This is a Wildberry mead, and it was made with... Um, uh, wild berry like flavoring from Amaretti. So uh, if you don't know anything about Amaretti, they are a company who makes um, different flavorings and they do a bunch of cool stuff. Um, I'm gonna you know go check them out Amaretti.com. But they had a uh, comp or not a compound, a natural artisan flavor for wild berry, mixed it into a traditional mead, and um, it came out pretty good. And I actually did something different with this. I've never back sweetened with um, maple syrup before. So what I did was I back sweetened when everything was done. And um, I made sure to, well, it, the maple syrup itself was actually uh, already like stabilized because it's not the nice natural maple syrup that I really wanted to buy. Um, instead, it's just this, you know, cheap, the, uh, I can't remember what brand it is now. Anyways, it had potassium sorbate in it. Which basically meant that the yeast could not chew on it. So I could back sweeten with it safely. So that's what I'm drinking tonight. It's really good. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. It's a little bit dry, surprisingly. Um, even with a little back sweetening. Uh, I didn't put, excuse me, a ton of, uh, <coughs> a ton of maple syrup in it. Because I didn't want it to be too sweet. Because that was kind of, that would be kind of lame. So, uh, that's what I'm drinking, and I've made a couple wild berry meads, mixed berry meads before, but this is by far my favorite, and I will be making more of it soon. Um, and, yeah. So now let's get into our next segment. In part two, right now, we're going to start talking about this main topic of freezing fruit and, you know, uh, putting fruit in the primary and secondary. It's a really big debate. A lot of people think, like, you know, uh, fruit in the primary is is the best way to go. Some people think secondary, but I want to kind of give you my opinions, and um, and we'll see from there, uh, kind of what you think. I would love to hear your feedback in YouTube comments, or maybe even just responses in general. So there's a little bit of a debate on whether or not to freeze your fruit, because um, there are certain things that happen when you do freeze fruit. One of the big things that happens is. Uh, the cells within that fruit actually, they of course freeze because they're frozen, but then they explode. And so there's some side effects of that being that the mead itself, the fruit within, um, actually give off a more flavor. Because that exploded, explosion of cells allows for um, the, the breaking down of the fruit, which then allows it to impart just better inside of a mead. It also generally, when you freeze fruit, makes it more mushy, which in some ways allows you to have more flavor as well. And um, I, I, at least, this is what I've heard, this is what I've experienced. Now, I've never done a frozen fruit versus not frozen fruit before, and I think that would be an interesting test to do in the future. However, I have not done that yet, so maybe one day. But um, I definitely have found when I freeze fruit, uh, especially small amounts of fruit, I generally have a pretty good flavor. Like the flavor imparts pretty well. And that's been really nice because I don't always make these or buy a ton of fruit. For example, if I made a blueberry mead, which is this one example I use a lot, um, 
blueberries are expensive and I'm probably not going to make myself a eight gallon batch of blueberry mead because blueberries are really expensive. So uh, last episode, I talked briefly about, or really the whole episode, about natural flavors versus, uh, like natural fruits versus the flavors you can get from people like Amaretti or Brewer's Best and that stuff. And I don't want to go into that. Go check out last episode, uh, episode three. But uh, I have found that using a lot of fruit costs a lot of money, and um, it doesn't always give the best flavor, especially depending on the fruit and the ripeness of it and all those things. There's lots of issues with that in that regard. However, um, there are, uh, there are lots of benefits to using real fruit. You do get probably a a better fermentation in regards to like a primary fermentation because you have nutrients that come from specific fruits and skins and that stuff. Uh, there's, there are a lot of pros to actually using real fruit. Um, so I would highly, you know, recommend doing that again. I don't want to get on the topic of this because that's all last episode was. Um, but I have definitely frozen a lot of fruit, had a lot of a lot of success through it. Uh, one thing you can do is you can actually, when you're freezing the fruit, you can um, freeze, thaw it out, thaw it out, let it thaw, then freeze again, let it thaw freeze, you know, do this process back and forth. And again, you're breaking down these cell walls, which allows, which allows for a greater impartation of fruit flavor. This is kind of specific to fruit though, because obviously if you freeze a cinnamon stick, nothing's going to happen to it. It just kind of stays the same. Um, and so that's kind of what I found. It doesn't really Obviously, juices, fruit juices, are not going to do anything either if you freeze them. Uh, it has to be the actual fruit because they have the cell walls within them and that stuff. So that that's kind of important. And the debate here that a lot of people have is like whether or not it's true that fruit, after fruit is frozen, the uh, the cell walls break down and that, that the flavor actually imparts better. I'd love to know what you think, though. Um, this, again, is an opinion. And uh, I'm going off of uh, multiple opinions, myself and other people who have recommended this. But uh, I do think it'd be interesting to hear what you have to say. I imagine there is a slight difference between a frozen fruit and a unfrozen fruit. Um, Yeah, so that kind of leads me to my next topic. And that is, if you are looking at making a mead with fruit, you have an option of either putting the fruit into the primary fermentation, which basically means that you are uh, you're putting it into the the bulk of the fermentation where a lot of the activity is happening that's what primary basically means where is the most yeast activity occurring and uh, normally it's in the first seven to 14 days of a mead or beer or whatever uh, the, the life of that alcohol because that's when the yeast are waking up they're chewing on sugars they are converting things to alcohol converting the sugars to alcohol and um, that that's where a lot of that activity happens within that activity depending on your yeast you use you might have some really vigorous fermentation so this is where the the line of putting your your uh, fruit in the primary or secondary can sort of depend on the yeast you use Um, and I'll talk about that more here in a second but as I've experienced um, I often put my fruit into the secondary which if you don't know anything about that the secondary is after the bulk of the fermentation has occurred you are left with a little bit of you know fermentation left so let's say the 14 days have gone by since i started my mead the airlock has slowed down pretty aggressively and or you know a lot and uh now i'm left with a stagnant ish mead if i rack it over into a new container there are still yeast in there that are viable and alive and you have to keep that in consideration whenever you take any next steps because uh, pr- uh, secondary fermentation basically occurs when you add more sugars more nutrients for the yeast to ferment on so if you want a secondary fermentation you have to really plan that and really need to understand that adding more nutrients affects the gravity how does your like the outcome of your ABV it also affects the flavor profile the yeast all those things even clarity so secondary fermentation is its own animal to tame in a way but um, it uh, it is definitely been more successful in my opinion for using fruit now let's get into the pros and cons of both um, 
I'm going to start with, since I'm already here, the secondary pros of putting your fruit into the secondary. So let's say you take your, my recipe was a gallon of water, three pounds of clover honey, and a uh, packet of Lalvin D47, um, which is a mildly, you know, aggressive yeast, like the ferment. So um, I have that and I let it go through the primary and let's say my starting gravity was 1.100. That's about 13.125% alcohol by volume. And uh, my D47 would get me through there because it goes up to 14%. Now I have the option of either leaving it and letting it be a traditional based on my recipe or going and adding, let's say, fruit in this case. And I want to make it an apple mead. So I have uh, gone ahead and... and um, bagged my fruit and cut it up and then of course cleaned it used some star say and that stuff and froze it and back to the topic of that you know freezing whatever we were talked about it um, froze my fruit thawed it out it's now the secondary and I'm putting it in so one of the pros of doing this is that your bulk of your fermentation has occurred meaning that you don't really have to worry about as much uh, uh, losing as much of the flavor of said you know apples um, out of the airlock and that's because you your bulk of your fermentation when it is fermenting like that when it's going crazy um, the aromatic smells oops sorry the aromatic smells and tastes you get from fruit from really anything um, are sorry let me back up the taste you get from a fruit often comes from the smell of said fruit or said ingredient in general that's why when you like plug your nose and then you eat something you don't have as much taste you don't taste it as well um, we rely so much on the aromatic flavors sm flavors aromatic smells of a ingredient to give us the flavor so uh when that, that aromatic side is blown out aggressively during the primary fermentation you often lose the flavor of the fruit of whatever ingredients and that's why um, in the secondary when there's a lower uh, amount of you know fermentation like that you're not losing as much of that flavor you also uh, are you know providing sugars in the secondary and a lot of times those sugars depending on how you know, far your yeast have gone, you might not hit your cap and you might be left with, with residual sweetness. When you provide those sugars in that secondary, like it, it changes the gravity and everything. And of course, we talked about a moment ago that yeast um, hitting its cap. So uh, I have found more success with that secondary just because the, the fact that you are getting more, um, more of the aromatic flavors out of this fruit. I also really like putting my fruit in the secondary because there is some alcohol content for your yeast to depend on. And that's important because whenever you're using fruit, um, there are naturally bacteria. You know, you try to sanitize your fruit the best you can, but let's say that you don't get everything. There are bacteria on there that are not always good that might try to take over your fermentation. When it's in the primary, there's no alcohol content for the yeast for that to fight that off. So what happens is that bad bacteria might be the thing that propels a, um, a bad fermentation. And you don't want the wrong yeast taking hold of your mead, because guess what? That stuff will ruin and make your mead taste bad. And that's lost ingredients, lost lots of things like that. So in the secondary, you have some um, ABV to combat that, which means that you probably won't have an issue with yeast a, a bad yeast taking over. They'll probably be kind of killed by the 13% ABV that you have. If you have a lower ABV mead, let's say you're making like a session mead that's like 5%, so real low, um, that's less, you know, not as helpful because that 5% is there. It is a little bit, uh, com combats a little bit of the bad bacteria. However, it's not perfect and it's not as nice as like a 14% plus which definitely kills bad bacteria. Um, so that's definitely one perk of adding it in there. You still have to go through the rigorous thing of like making sure you push the fruit down um, in the secondary, just like in the primary. You have to make sure that you're not uh, just letting it go for you know eternity because eventually fruit does go bad even when it is, quote, preserved in a secondary fermentation. Um, 
There's just certain things like that. There's other topics we could talk about. You could dive into how long do you leave your fruit in, all those things. I will give you a blanket statement and say I have found varied success with um, two weeks to four weeks, depending on the fruit. Most of the time, I take mine out by the two to three week mark. Very rarely have I gone four weeks with a fruit in a mead. So the secondary has those perks. You have alcohol content, you have primary fermentation out of the way, so you're losing less of the aromatic flavors um, from, I keep saying aromatic flavors, aromatic smells of that fruit. Let's go to the other side of the fence. This is uh, the primary. So if you are fermenting with your same recipe I mentioned earlier, one, pound, one gallon of water, uh, three pounds of honey, and a packet of Lavin D47, you throw your apples, your three pounds of apples in the primary, uh, you're going to have success as well, just a different flavor profile. Um, we talked a moment ago about you know the primary fermentation. You're probably going to lose a little bit of that aromatic uh, smell, again, leading to different tastes. However, there are the perk of putting your fruit into the primary in the bulk is that some yeast do really well with certain fruits. So... Um, for example, like the Lauvin K1V116, um, I have found great success within apples and citrusy fruits and things like that because those those yeast naturally put off those fruity esters, those, um, yeah, the esters of, like that, which combine well when you use apples and oranges and all those. Um, so there's a perk of that. If you do that in the primary, then those yeast have those things to work with. They have that ammunition and then as they're fermenting, they are naturally producing those esters. That doesn't mean that in the secondary they can't do that. It's just they're not going to be doing it as confidently because they're kind of tuckered out. They're tired from the uh, primary fermentation. So you won't have as much of that to uh, you know, ring true. So there's one side. The other side is that you naturally have nutrients that, are, that come from... Um, apples and all that from the skins and from the meat of the apple and, and whatever else fruit. Uh, I keep saying apples because it's a good one to go to. You could do this with any fruit. Uh, pears. Uh, I've never done watermelon. That'd be, I've never used actual watermelon. Um, papayas. You know Anything you can think about. Uh, there are naturally nutrients in that. And your yeast need nutrients to actually succeed, believe it or not. So that's why we put yeast nutrient and yeast energizer into a mead to help it succeed. Can a mead succeed without um, those things? Yeast nutrient, yeast energizer. Yes, but also no, because they they need that food to survive. And so we have lots of different ways. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because that turns into another topic in general. But the nutrients you get from, you know, different fruits helps the fermentation. So uh, you still get a good fruit flavor from primary fermentation, depending on your yeast and how they you know, interact with the fruit. Um, you might have a stronger flavor. You might have a weaker flavor. If it's a really, really vigorous fermentation, which I've had before where they just bubble up, um, you might lose a lot of that fruit flavor. Uh, but you, know, it, you just got to decide which side do you want, what do you want to do. That's why I go secondary more often. Um, so... I have found, that's at least my research, the stuff that I've experienced as I've been making mead. There's no perfect way to do it. If I could nail down a perfect way, I would say it's to actually do both. So let's say you're making your same recipe I mentioned earlier, a gallon of water, three pounds of honey, one uh, pa packet of Lavin D47. You have three pounds of apples, perfect. Put half, one and a half pounds into the primary, let that go through, and then one and a half pounds into the secondary. And let that go through. And what you'll get is both sides. In the primary, you're feeding the yeast. You're giving them nutrients. They are chewing on those esters from the apples, doing all that stuff. Then, fermentation's done. Rack it off. Most of that fermentation is done, leading to, um, you know, when you put the apples in the secondary, you probably, you'll either have a little bit of re-fermentation, um, or you won't have any, depending on your yeast cap, what has happened there. And, uh... That, that's my best way I've done it. The, when I just made my last sizer, I actually did it that way. I did half and half, and it was incredible. It worked really well. Um, it does take a little more planning, 
Um, and honestly, there's some clarity issues within using fruit in general, but that also creates more clarity issues uh, as well. So believe it or not, my the most clear meads I've found, at least with that, within apples and like uh, pears and stuff like that, was when I put the fruit into the primary because I think it the, the yeast feed on all the sugars and all the nutrients there and then everything drops out of suspension quicker whereas if you put it in the secondary you might have a less clear mead and that's a topic of like you know if I want to clear up my mead how do I do it um, to sh give you a short answer you can use uh, cleaning agents um, like easy clear you can use bentonite um, really anything that like you find at a local brew shop works um, the only thing with that is that does change some of the flavors sometimes you can also uh, uh was it filter your meads sorry filter those meads through a system that just costs money to have that said system and uh there's a bunch of other options i think i've already talked about on the podcast before but uh, fruit is a using fruit in a mead is really nice because everyone likes a good fruit flavor i mean people like apple juice people like um, mango juice, anything like that. So what you're achieving basically with a fruit mead is that is like an alcoholic, you know, fruit juice. And, um, it's pretty good. I've had lots of success. Lots of people really like that stuff at the end of the day though. Like if you can't do both and you need to pick one, uh, I don't want to tell you an absolute. I will tell you that I choose to do secondary. If you like to do primary fermentation for your, the bulk of your fruit, um, addition, that's fine. If you have found success in that manner, absolutely. There's no perfect way to make mead. And I think that it's important that we know that every like ingredient is different. If I get the same recipe here in Oklahoma, and then I go to Wichita, you know, or let's say I go all the way up to, to um, like Washington. Well, that same recipe, there's going to be different parts different flavors that come from the honey there that come from the um the like water even so the only real consistent variable that we find um, in ingredient wise is your yeast generally yeast are pretty similar from place to place now the other side of it is while that's the same you have different fermentation time like timelines altitudes heat cold it's all a science. So again, no perfect way to ferment, no perfect way to make these things. And I don't want to ever pretend that I know the absolute. So as you're making it, explore, experiment, you might have greater success in one way. Um, I think the just most surefire way to do it is primary and secondary, if you can afford it. So um, let me know what you think below, maybe or below or in the in the comments or shoot me an email or something. I would love to hear what you have to say. Um, you might have greater success with primary you might agree secondary who knows um all of this is is my own opinions and i i enjoy getting to try new things i think um at least on my channel i've done a couple different uh thing a couple different tests with this so i did it specifically this specific primary or secondary test with uh pineapples and i made a traditional mead I put the pineapples in the primary of one. I put the pineapples in the secondary of the other one uh, after it had finished fermenting. And what happened there, um, I can't remember what yeast I used exactly, but I remember that I got different characters from the pineapple um, on each side. So like in the, I'm trying to think, I think the primary, I had a greater like uh, middle this is a weird explanation, but like when you bite into a pineapple, you get a difference of like a, a sweet and a tart and then like a sweet. So what I, or sorry, maybe it's backwards, tart, sweet, and then tart. So I think I, that's kind of what I had was I had this tart, uh, flavor mainly was like the beginning. If I think I'm right. So the primary, cause I had, uh, what was it? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. The primary was, it was more tart taste throughout the the mead for whatever reason the yeast had picked up that flavor more and ran with it um in that primary in the secondary i got more of like a sweet kind of pineapple taste like the end of that pineapple and um that was pretty interesting and the only way i can explain because i had the same variables same honey same everything 
um, is that the yeast responded and the mead in general responded differently to primary and secondary introduction of pineapples. I haven't done this with every fruit. Um, again, that would be wild for me to do that, and I will probably never have the time or capabilities to do that. But I will continue to do tests similar to that where um, I'm seeing if one is better than the other. And in truth, um, it really depends on the fruit. It also depends on your other ingredients. We've talked a lot about fruit. If you're doing this with spices, if you're doing this with, um, you know, grains, with malts, with anything like that, even honeys sometimes uh, can, it, it can all be dependent on your primary and secondary fermentation. So uh, I highly encourage you to just try to make your own. You'd be surprised at how much you already know, and uh, you'll be surprised at what comes out. Generally, the stuff we make is is pretty good. I've made some really bad meads. Um, I've made 71 meads and beers and wines so far, and uh, I've only had four of them absolutely fail. So my ratio is pretty good, and that's not a boast to me. That's just uh, generally that the mead makes itself. Once you throw the ingredients together, you don't have to do too much. Um, so that's kind of nice. What we have to do, the variable we have to control is introduction of ingredients, um, quality of ingredients in general, and then um, just knowing how to measure, how to properly uh, diagnose your mead problems, how to deal with that stuff. And that just takes time and uh, research and effort. And again, you'll get there if you spend some time doing it. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the bulk of this. Um, that topic, and I'm going to move on from it. Again, leave me your comments. Leave me, shoot, shoot me an email. Shoot me a Facebook message if you uh, um, have any questions, if you have any comments. Now, my last segment I always talk about is mead successes slash mead failures. And so today I'm going to talk about, um, really, I'm going to hit both sides of the fence. I didn't have a really big mead failure recently. No, that's not true. I had a big mead failure. I'll start with my success, and then I'll get to my failure. So my, uh, my success has been, I've been making more and more recipes recently, and I, um, I just finished an apple sizer, one, a, uh, you know, recipe that I've been making for a long time, and I've been trying to make it better and better. And I, I made this apple sizer using apple juice, I think four gallons of water, um, 15 pounds of apples. I used three different kinds of apples, Fuji, Gala, and Pink Lady apples, and I did it in different combinations, uh, or like that. I put them all in the secondary, and it came out incredible. I put a cinnamon stick in it. It was awesome. And I think my success recently has been that I finally found, I feel like, that recipe that I really like that works well. Of course, I'll continue to tweak it. However, um, I think I'm at least 90% there. So that's a step forward in the right direction. And then I hope you're getting to make your own meads and, and maybe find that same success. So my failure now... Um, really doesn't affect you guys. It's more of just a frustration on my end. Uh, I've had two big video fails recently. One was I created for my um, the Valentine's Day. I'm If you have seen, I made a Valentine's Day mead. And I did went through the whole process of recording a video and um, doing all the stuff. And then only to realize my camera, my like pack lavalier microphone that I used to record with was... Um, like not plugged in all the way. And so I didn't have any audio for this like 25 minute video that I shot. So that was very frustrating and I kind of had to just deal with that, but that was, that was no big deal. And the other one was uh, actually funny enough with this podcast. I, uh, I recorded the same podcast basically almost. I've, I've changed up, obviously not verbatim, the words I've said, but uh, I recorded this podcast only to realize that my audio setup that I use, something had gone awry and... I had to trash the whole thing. So you're hearing this set the second time. I think I've actually uh, demonstrated my knowledge a little better this time and hopefully clarified better than the first time around. So uh, mead failures, basically just me on my video side. I haven't had any big, um, like, disastrous meads occur recently. And I'm hoping I don't because that's not fun to toss one down the sink. So hope you guys have a... Uh, enjoyed getting to hear these these episodes so far we're on episode four of course so i'm going to continue them on every two weeks so two weeks from the day this is posted there should be another one um coming out and i would love to hear your 
what you want to hear about. Because at the end of the day, I have topics I want to talk about, but I want to know what you're interested in. Do you want to hear about specific thing? Um, and that will help me guide what you guys want to hear. I'm talk I'm covering the basics right now of primary and secondary fermentation, adding fruit, uh, and the previous ones, you know, everything I've talked about so far has been pretty basic, but I'd love to hear if you have any requests. So I enjoy getting to make content. Of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're getting to see me in video form. If you're listening on, on, um, podcast you're probably just hearing it which is fine um go check out vice versa so if you're in your car you can listen to this on the way to work or whatever but uh this has been a lot of fun i hope you guys have enjoyed this i'll be back again with uh, another episode i need your uh requests i need your your opinions uh down below but with all that said go check out my other uh, links and stuff i think i have stuff in my bio of both of these uh, if you want to support me um, there's a bunch of links down below and I, I just appreciate you guys time. So hope you have a wonderful day and, uh, I'll see you guys next time. So with that, 